Hello, and welcome to the Say Yes to Holiness podcast. I'm Christina Simmons, and if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to subscribe so that that way you'll know whenever I post a new podcast. And if you are listening to this, then make sure to subscribe on whatever your favorite listening platform is. Um, I now am trying to grow just a little bit so that I can do different ads on my podcast uh, than the one that I have. So my apologies for that uh, kind of, uh, you know, continued duplication over and over again. But uh, if I pick up I think it's another 10 people uh, to follow. Then what happens is, is that then I'm able to do different ads. So uh, if you haven't been, you know, haven't been a subscriber yet, please do so. And then hopefully I can uh, change up a little bit of what you have there for ads if you listen to them. So without further ado, we jump into the middle of Lent here. We're actually into our second full week. If you're listening to this when I'm going to be posting, and this last weekend we had, you know, first weekend of Lent, uh, we had about going out into the desert, the three temptations. And then this last weekend we had the transfiguration. Coming up, because we're in year A, are the great stories. Uh, this weekend is going to be the woman at the well in Samaria. And absolutely love that because it's such a beautiful model for us in our own journey uh, of conversion, but then evangelizing, sharing the story of the good news of how we have been changed as well. But we begin with food for the head. And this comes directly from St. John the Apostle, and you will recognize this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So, as I said, you probably have recognized that because it's the beginning of the Gospel of John. This is how St. John the Apostle is the, is the author of this. But it's the beginning of the Gospel of John. And why would I, you know, include this as food for the head? Because we need to be mindful throughout, especially during this Lenten season, of the just the great gift you know, that God gave us his only son. But not only that, also for us to reflect on with what humility God took when he became the word made flesh. And he did this so that all things could have life. And that includes us. So redemption is primarily about the person, you know, human beings who are made in the image and likeness of God, but it's also about the redemption of all the world. And this is what happens when the Son of God becomes flesh. And John just beautifully is able to capture these huge theological, you know, ideas, and he captures them beautifully and poetically. And what they should do, or I hope that they do for us, is that they should inspire us. They should lift up our hearts and our minds to a place of gratitude. But we tend to just ignore them, don't we? We tend to, you know, we've heard it before, and therefore we kind of check out. We're not attentive. We're not present. And, you know, we forget that you know, when we ignore whoever or whatever it is that we know is true, then we're not going to be paying attention as we should when the real th message is being given to us. And when we aren't attentive, when we think we know it already, then we become lukewarm. We become jaded. Um, and it might not be an intentionality at all. It might not be that we're like, quote, going through a hard time, but we definitely aren't on fire to go out and to share the good news that Jesus, by becoming 
flesh, by becoming the word becoming flesh, he suffered and died for us and redeemed us so that we could have life. Because Lent, believe it or not, is all about life. It might not seem that way with all the penances, with all the sacrifice, you know, all the almsgiving, all of this. It seems to be a really heavy season at times, I know. But the fact is, is that it's about life. The church, in her beautiful wisdom, gives us the Lenten season, the liturgical year as a whole, but the Lenten season in particular, to ensure that we do meditate upon the seriousness and also the tragicness of Jesus's life and the reality of how God made good come from it. And this is the thing that we have to remember is that Jesus came so that we could have life to the full, that we could have that life of abundance. And this is why we're encouraged to do prayer and fasting and almsgiving, so that we can do our part to help rectify and properly order ourselves on the things that truly matter. So we can put first things first, so we can put God first, so that we can you know, uh, govern our passions and we can not have them govern us, you know, direct us. And also so that we can learn to love others with a Christ-life love. Um, I was just listening to a podcast this morning, actually, about, you know, who's our enemy. And actually, the people that we disagree with, the people that, you know, um, you know, uh, we, we are totally diametrically opposed to personality wise, whatever. Those are the easy people to love because it doesn't hurt so much. Yeah, it's, it still hurts, you know, to be rejected or to be treated badly, of course. But the fact is, is that the true pain that we encounter is when those who we love, who are near and dear to us, and they betray us, they reject us, they disappoint us. Those are the enemies that we have to learn to love better. And this is how almsgiving helps us do that. So again, we do these things so that we can get into right relationship with God. Prayer is the primary way we do this. So we can get into right relationship with ourselves, fasting, does this and almsgiving helps us get into right relationship with one another so remember that jesus came so that we might have life and he's inviting us into relationship with him into the divine life and this is how we have to go about living out the divine life by partaking in it this is how we have to live it out so we can have life to the full. Our food for the heart comes from St. Thomas Aquinas. He writes, In this life, no one can fulfill his longing, nor can any creature satisfy man's desire. Only God satisfies. He infinitely exceeds all other pleasures. That is why man can rest in nothing but God. This is very similar to the words of St. Augustine, um, who said, you know, back in the, in the 300s, you know, our hearts, Lord, are restless until they rest in you. And St. Thomas Aquinas is, you know, taking it and, and adjusting the, the words a little bit, but the very in, intentional focus is on whenever or wherever we attempt to find rest or comfort outside of God, then we're going to find it that it's severely lacking and it doesn't take away our anxiety and we're not filled with peace. We can look around and look at ourselves, myself included, about the fact that we're trying to find comfort and peace outside of God. When we binge watch a show or, you know, not, not in all cases, okay? But we have to think about 
why are we doing these things? Making sure that they're in the right proportion that they should be and that we're not trying to find comfort or, um, you know, you know uh, caring in something or in someone other than God. Because at some point or another, they are going to be lacking. Even our spouses, you know, um, you know, for those of us who are married, even our spouses will disappoint, right? Rarely happens, absolutely. But, uh, but the fact is, is that even our spouses will disappoint. God never will. And the way of the world, and this is the temptation that we have to resist, is, you know, that whole idea of getting that quick fix of pleasure or comfort in order to distract ourselves from whatever the pain is that we're trying to avoid or in our desires that we're trying to fill and only God can can fill and can fill it. So in order to be able to truly rest in God, to truly have our desires quenched in him, we have to learn to be with him. And this is what prayer is about. Prayer is simply, as St. Teresa of Avila says, is simply a conversation with God. It's simply a conversation with the person who should be your best friend. But of course, to become best friends, we've got to spend time. And, you know, so often we don't do this. And even if we do spend time, Often we won't spend time getting to know about him. We won't read his word. Uh, we, you know, won't allow it to seep into our, our minds and our, our souls. Um, and this is one of the, uh, one of the great beauties, uh, just as an aside, of the Father Mike Smith's Bible in a Year, is that even if you're not studying it, Okay, you know, it, even if you're just listening to it and you're not taking notes and you're not using it, you know, to dive into greater scripture study, it still has value. Why? Because it's immersing you in God's word. And, and the more that we do that, the more that his word will transform our minds and our hearts. But we need to, you know, learn how to do this. One of the best ways that I've learned, you know, and I share with people, you know, and it's a simplified you know, version of Lexio Divina, and it's the four R's. And it's you read God's word, and then you reflect upon it. You think about, okay, what, what is God trying to say to me in this instance? And then we relate. These are the two pieces. So the first two we do pretty well. We'll read it. We'll reflect on it. We'll think about what we think. But then what we tend to do is that we tend to not relate. We tend not to share with God what it is that we think. And then we don't wait to hear what God has to say. We don't have a true relationship. It's all a one way. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, the old receivers, you know, you uh, click the button, you know, a CB receiver. And as long as you got the button clicked and you're talking, the other person can't talk back. And that's what we tend to be doing in our prayer. We have to learn to take our thumb, our you know, hand off the button, the talk button, and allow God to transmit back. And then the final one is that resolution. It's we resolve to live out in whatever it is that God has shared with you that day. In a very small, concrete, doable way, we put it into practice in our life. And then when we do these things, it's amazing how our day is different. When we begin with God, spending time with him, growing in that relationship with him, then we learn to rest with and in him. And when we do that, then we become better able to become his instrument in the world as well. But we have to be willing to rest and to turn to him first, not all the created things in the world that aren't going to satisfy, but we got to make that decision. 
Our food for the hands comes from St. Therese of Lisieux. She says, I know now that true charity consists in bearing all of our neighbor's defects, not being surprised at their weakness, but edified at their smallest virtues. Going back to almsgiving, this is the whole reason why we practice almsgiving is so that we are able to truly come to true charity. So we can really love. We can love our enemies. We can love those who have defects. And all of us, including me big time, have defects. All of us have something that is a weakness, that is something that is annoying to someone else. Uh, there's all sorts of different defects that we have. And defects are not bad. And to be honest, I you know, and this is my personal opinion, I think our defects are actually the wounds that have developed over time that God has allowed, just like St. Paul's thorn in the flesh, God has allowed them so that when we finally come to him and allow him to transform them, they're going to become the signs of his greatest glory in our lives. But what we need to focus on, though, is we have to develop a mind and a heart and a soul that is open to giving and to loving. And we do this most simply through the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. You can find a, a detailed, you know, description, you know, of what that looks like from Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 25. But almsgiving's focus is about helping us grow in love of others. And when we grow in love, then when we run into people's defects, when we run into their weaknesses, it's not a big deal. It's just like, okay. Yeah, you had to put up with me, you know, uh, I can definitely put up with you. So when we then are doing this, then when they do something that is virtuous, when they do the good quickly and easily and with joy, we are edified. We become better. Why? Because that's how the body of Christ works. It is the most amazing interconnection that we have, this relationship that we have with one another, of how God has connected us all through the this idea, you can almost think of it as a relationship plane of where we're all interconnected. And it's something that when we love more, then the more and the more we will the good for others, which is what love is, then we're going to benefit from even the smallest advance of another person. Wow, that's just amazing. So, you know, just think about this. Doesn't, as a parent, it, for, any, for all of you out there who are parents, okay, don't you rejoice or if you're remembering your parents, don't, don't, you know, didn't they rejoice in just the smallest accomplishment? You know, we, we did some drawing that really wasn't that great when you look back at it, but they just rejoiced in the accomplishment. Um, and it's the same for each of us. Anytime that there's an advancement, we should rejoice. We should be sharing in the joy of that person. And as we do that, then our own love continues to increase and deepen. So we need to bear the defects of our neighbors. Do it without complaint. <laughs> do it, uh, you know, so that we are able to grow in charity, but then also so that when they grow in charity just in a little bit, then we too benefit from it and we can rejoice. And this is why Jesus and his church tells us to give alms. When we're doing works of mercy, we're learning to grow in charity by persevering in those acts, even if it's not deserved. And then that charity is prompted within others. They used to have this commercial series all about, you know, um, you know, someone sees someone do something good and then someone, you know, and then it propels someone else to do to do the same. This is how charity works. And this is also 
is when Jesus rejoices. And he is so happy when we are doing this. But as St. Therese said, true charity consists in bearing of our neighbor's defects so that we can be edified by their smallest virtues. Our food for the feet comes from St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. She writes, What was the first rule of our dear Savior's life? You know it was to do his Father's will. Well, then the first end I propose in our daily work is to do the will of God. Secondly, to do it in the manner he wills. And thirdly, to do it because it is his will. So, St. Elizabeth does a beautiful job of simply, you know, you know, laying out for us. And she was doing this for her community, but she lays it out for us too about how should we go about living our lives. And she gives us that first, you know, first rule, you know, which is do the will of God in our daily work. So we're not having to go someplace else. We're not having to go and do anything you know different. It's just do his will in the midst of our daily work. Then to do it in a manner that he wants. What's that mean? It means that we should do it virtuously or as virtuously as we can with trust and love. So again, to you know to do a virtuous act means to do the good and you do it promptly and you do it easily and you do it with joy. So this is the manner in which God asks us. And then thirdly, do it because it's his will. In other words, the old parent standby, do it because I said so. <laughs> so I, I share that because it's a threefold reminder of why it is that we should be persevering in our Lenten resolutions. We might be Oh, wavering a little bit. We might have kind of cut ourselves some slack on Sunday, which it's fine. You know, I'm not here to judge. But the fact is, is that we will justify everything in our lives. And if we were intentional and in discernment of our resolution prior to the beginning of Lent, then one of the rules of discernment that St. Ignatius of Loyola gives us, which is, when it gets difficult, when we don't feel like it, that's when we need to continue to do what it is that we resolve to do. You don't change a resolution midstream. You don't change a resolution when you're not at a place of peace. That's the key. So if you're struggling right now with some of your resolutions, kind of bear down a little bit and whichever part of that you know the threefold you know part saint elizabeth lays out for you that speaks to you right now you know could it be that hey i don't have to go anywhere different to do god's will and i can be obedient or is it hey i i get to grow in virtue so i get to do it quickly and easily and with joy if that inspires and encourages you great or if you kind of need a little bit of a kick in the butt, God told you to do it, so do it. So this is how St. Elizabeth so beautifully lays out for us how it is that we can become an imitation of Christ, how we can become more and more like Christ through our obedience. And again, remember, obedience is to listen. So if you listened well, leading up to Lent, and you came to resolutions, and you're like, okay, these are the resolutions that I'm going to abide by, then trust that God is going to give you the grace you need in order to fulfill them. And that might be the final thing that I leave you with today. If you're struggling with your resolution, my question to you is, are you trying to do the resolution? Are you relying only on yourself? Or are you turning to God immediately and saying, Lord, this is a, this is a tough situation. I, I can already tell that this is a near occasion of sin, that I'm, I'm in the sense of I'm not going to be able to fulfill my Lenten resolution. Um, you know, 
or I'm going to literally fall into sin because I know that this is not a bad, you know, not a good situation for me. Um, and turn to Him, trust Him. This is what God wants us to be doing. This is why we make this Lenten journey to turn to Christ, to turn to God first to not rely upon ourselves, to recognize that He is God and we are not, and that all is His grace. But each time that we try to do it on our own, what we do is we block His grace from being able to strengthen us and encourage us and to help us persevere. We, it, it's effectively like putting up a roadblock, where it's like, no, no, I got this. No, I'm fine, thanks. And... Jesus said, come to me who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Come, take my yoke. It is easy and light. This only happens when we turn to him, when we give it all to God, and we say, Lord, I'm not able to do this without you. So trust and be obedient.